Welcome to Sound of the Yellow Horn, where faith, tradition, and philosophy meet the modern world. Here is your host, Mark Greer. Hello everyone, welcome to the Sound of the Galler Horn and Hail the Gods and Goddesses. I'm your host, Mark Pereer, and today we are going to talk about the Norna Society. We are going to give you a full-on introduction of what the Norna Society is, what it's about, and everything that we're doing in our projects and our work, and what we see and hope to have accomplished for the future. Now this is a big deal to us. This is what the foundation of all of our work, um, foundation of everything that we've been working on for the last 10, 12 years, you know, um, it's actually the Norton Society. Actually, we started it because I've been doing work for years. I've been in the heathen community for 25 years and I've been doing work and research for a long time. So I, you know, we decided that we were going to start this and pay homage to the great, um, you know, society that translated a lot of the works that we appreciate and value. Uh, before we go into all that, though, I want to make a brief discussion about the sound of the Gyaller horn and its various incarnations, uh, what we've gone through, um, the various things that we've done over the years. We've had several um, different incarnations of it through various radio programs and stations and all that. And we, um, after going through, you know, various different types of drama for different episode, uh, different radio stations, all that, we decided that from now on, we're not going to go through radio stations. We're not going to go through third parties. We're going to continue doing our work and we're going to, um, start putting all this on YouTube. So you can su subscribe to our channel. We'll put our shows on our, on our website. Um, we'll promote the links and all that stuff so that people can listen to our information and listen to it directly from us. And so there won't ever be any issues about that. Um, this isn't going to be a weekly show like we've done before or a bi-weekly show. We're going to do this once a month. Um, that way I can focus on making sure that the content is as uh, valuable to you as possible. And so that's that's really what we're going to focus on with the sound of the Gyaller horn. I want to try to start doing this every month so that we can have discussions, have the talks and all that stuff. And so, you know, in honor of that, uh, we're going to start out with basically an introduction of the work we're doing with the Norna Society. So the first thing we want to ask ourselves is what are we doing? What is the Norna Society doing? What is our focus? The focus of the Norna Society is not to become, you know, some dry academic organization where we stand around pondering over books our entire lives and focusing only on, you know, what's written in stories or whatever and trying to recreate something in an exact form as if we we're archaeologists or something like that. That's not our goal. Our goal is to create um, or rebuild a religious foundation for us to live our lives by today. It's using the most intense research that we have, a lot of the um, great pioneers of this research, like Jacob Grimm and Victor Rydberg and Rossman Sanderson. These people are like heroes to us, and so we we try to you know pay tribute to their work, and we try to pay tribute to what they did in order to make this these. Uh, theories and ideas and concepts into a reality, into a religion that can be celebrated and honored. Um, but it's not simply for academic sake. It's, it's to create a hierology. It's to create a body of, of sacred wisdom and tradition and custom for you to use in your life. And so that's what we're doing. That's what our focus is. We look for gaps. We look for things where, where we are wanting, things that our faith needs. And we try to figure out how we can do that, how we can rebuild that using the information that's been left behind us. But we're not out to recreate the perfect incarnation of the idea of Osadru as it was practiced in the 10th century. That was, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're ever going to do. And I know people, some people like that. Some people don't. It's just the way it is. That's what we're, that's what our focus is. That's what our belief is. So the foundation of this is, uh, what we call the 12 fundamentals research. Now, for the longest time as a heathen, I, um, you know, I've been in the heathen community for 25 years and I recall the days when most of our information came from pamphlets and flyers and, you know, there was the Odinus Fellowship and, uh, uh, the Austro Free Assembly and a lot of different groups putting out uh, information out there that um, we, uh, you know, would just get little bits and pieces. But then people started writing books and it was great. 
you know, um, the, the, the first, when we first started doing, uh, this, when, you know, Heathen Restri- first started publishing, a lot of, a lot of the books that were coming out were like Wiccan, New Age books, um, people trying to interpret our faith through a, uh, New Age lens, which was, you know, to us just not acceptable. And we didn't like that. And we think that, you know, that's pretty much what gave birth to the universalist movement, which is sort of a, a watering down of our faith, we believe. And, um, so, you know, we wanted something more profound and, and people started writing, you know, slowly these books started trickling in that um, where they started writing texts and things that allowed people to um, start experiencing the actual religion. You know, what is this about? Where, where does it come from? Now, the problem that I had with those books was that they started getting very repetitive. You know, it was like almost like the, the same book was being written over and over and over again. You had a little bit of lore, you had a little bit on the runes, you had a little bit of rituals, and that was it. And and it was like, there's so much more to our culture, so much more to what we have. And so, you know, we developed the 12 Fundamentals research based on, you know, looking at other cultures, looking at other people. Um, my thing was, you know, looking at some of the Hindu festivals where you can just see their entire civilization, their entire culture right there in your face. And that kind of inspired me to um, to develop the 12 Fundamentals Research because I was actually in the process of trying to write one of those books that was uh, one of those repetitive books where I had lore. and But I thought I could take it like as far as I could go, you know, like just keep putting information and putting information. And then after I had a 700 page, 800 page book, I was like, no one's going to want to read this because it's just it was huge. And uh, so I realized that we had to break this up. We had to break up this information and start focusing on it a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And then once we did that, the information would start to, you know, sort of come to us. I mean, once we started just focusing on one aspect, one single aspect of our culture, I started to notice that you could find all these little, these little tidbits that you didn't know about before, you know, um, just little, little things here and there. And then, then they got bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, uh, one, one example, uh, for me is the, you know, in the Faroe Islands, they have, you know, a lot of the folk dancing and heathen traditions that they know are, are, are you know, descended from the heathen lines. And I didn't know that. I had no idea. And, and there's like all these small traditions, like the Norna Grout and, and the fire bowls and, and, and all these different things that would come to us. And we started f- discovering more and more and more and more because we were actually looking. We were actually taking the time to focus only on this aspect. And, and that allowed our research to just blossom and bloom and become what we're doing today. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take each aspect of the culture and we're trying to, um, we want to write a book on each one. We want to write, uh, you, you know, online courses for them. We wanted to, we want to make it where you can experience each aspect because it allows you to have choices and based on what you're interested in, what you value, what you appreciate. You know, not everybody's going to want to do rituals. Not everybody cares about the runes. Not everybody is wants to get all immersed in lore. Some people might just like to cook or might like to dance or like, like music. And so these things allow you to experience the faith in your way. That aspect is your spiritual represent, representation of the faith itself. And it allows you to, to immerse yourself within it based on how you connect to it. You may not connect to it at bloats. I mean, I hope you do. And, and everybody wants that. But that may not be the way that you you experience it, you know, and and that's okay. That's that's fine. That's the great thing about polytheism is that your path to it is your path. And so the twelve fundamentals we have are lore, pantheon, law, nature, diet, music, dance, combat, ritual and prayer, folk and ancestry, arts and crafts, and spirituality. Now each one of these fundamentals has like their an uh, complete world for you to walk into and experience and learn from you just have to look for it you have to find it you have to experience it and become a part of it and that's how you connect to it and this is what what we're trying to do is 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 to basically open the door for you to help you to to see and find that information so it's right there for you because a lot of the stuff you know if you're in an english-speaking country like i am uh, you know, it's not going to be readily available to you because it's in another language, it's from another country, it's it's ancient, it's archaic, it's hidden away in a, in a library somewhere and you got to find it. I mean, these, you know, so we're trying to become the discoverers of these things so that we can help people who are, don't have that connection to them to find them. And so, 
and then once you find them and, and you make them a part of your lives, it becomes a part of a tradition, a tradition for you. We are not out. The Norna Society is not out to make a codified dogma on a global scale. All right. That is not our, our efforts. That is not what we are trying to do. What we are trying to do is we're trying to give the lay the foundation, lay all of this information out so that you can piece it together and pull it together so that you can find what traditions you want to follow for your family, for your clan, for your kindred, for your hearth, whatever you have going on. We want to ha want you to be able to have all of the information that you need in order to make what you want out of this and experience it in the way that you want to. And so I've always been a big fan, a big believer in options. You need options. You need as many choices as possible. You don't need to be bogged down by one single system, one single program that's, that applies to everyone and all that stuff. I mean, that, we're a tribal religion. That's not how it works. So you have to, you know, you, if you have a, a, a database or a, a collection of information that you can grab from and say, okay, well, I like this tradition. I like that tradition. I'm going to pull this here and piece this together. Then that's going to become who you are, part of your identity, part of your culture. And then once you have that, once you have that codified for yourself, it becomes your dogma. Now, I know we don't like to say that word, but that's what it is. It's a, it's a, it, tribalism is a, a dogma for just the tribe. It's not a global, like everybody has to follow this because that's not what it is. It's, it's, you know, this is my family tradition, my family, my clan, our people, it connects to us. But the thing is, is that once you codify it for your family, for your tribe or clan or whatever, it has to be codified. You can't just let it become, remain fluid because if you do that, then it's, it becomes nothing and it dies away and it doesn't exist. But I've told people for years that tradition is much, much more powerful than religion because religion is just a bunch of words on a page. Tradition is something living that exists. It's a part of our lives. And a good example of that is the celebration of Christmas by Christians who know that Jesus Christ, if he was existed at all, uh, that he was not born on December 25th. They know that. All their biblical scholars know that. All of their religious scholars know that. But they cannot let it go. They cannot let it go because it is so fundamental to their tradition that it's a part of who they are. And so it's more powerful than their religion. It exists as something greater than their religion, even though they'll never say that, admit it, but that's what it is because they don't let it go. They can't let the, the heathen traditions, traditions that they know are heathen, like the Yule tree and the giving of gifts and, and decorations and, you know, drinking a punch and eggnog and all these different traditions that they have at Easter and Halloween and Yule. They know these are heathen traditions, but they still celebrate them because it's a tradition, a tradition that's stronger than their faith. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to establish tradition, tradition that is stronger than religion, tradition that is stronger than anything, because it's, it is what you will pass down to your descendants for generations to come. So in that, um, you know, that's basically the foundation of the ideas that we're working behind. Um, we have several books that we've put out. Uh, we have our very first book was The Nature of Asatru. This is our book on basically just laying out the general philosophy of what we believe, what we think, how we think. Um, it goes into a lot of different aspects of the faith, a lot, a lot of different ideas. Uh, my wife even has a chapter in there for women, um, women coming to Asatru and connecting to it and all that. Um, then we have the Asatru Edda and the Odinist Edda, two different books. The Asatru Edda, uh, these are, these are our lore. This is, um, uh, you know, I took, uh, like 15 years, uh, just about, uh, to put this together. I used the works of Victor Rydberg, um, as the foundation for this. It helped me to find the works and piece them all together, put them together. Um, uh, my friend, William Reeves, he helped me a lot with it. He's the, the lore master. I mean, the guys like his research is above anything. I mean, other, other scholars aren't even on the same planet as him. Um, and we put this together and, and we basically d decided that we would, you know, uh, take all of the lore, all the information and not interpret it, but actually use the original sources and piece it together like a giant puzzle so that we would have a coherent epic from the story of Gananga Gap to the story of Ragnarok. And that's, that's basically what we set out to do. So we have these two books, the Ostru Edda uses a lot more of the old Norse terms, um, written how they were, you know, using the, the characters, the umlauts and the, the, you know, the thorn symbol and the Ed symbol, and, you know, the things that you'll see there. And some people, they don't like that. Some people, it gives them a headache to sit there and look at all those old Norse, old Norse words that aren't part of their native tongue. 
So, you know, so we put together the Odinistetta, which is more anglicized. It got rid of all the Old Norse terms, got rid of a lot of the uh, the, the, the spelling and all that stuff and anglicized those uh, to make it better for people. And people who consider themselves Odinists use a more anglicized uh, version of the lore and, and ideas. So we wanted to cater to that. We wanted to pay respects to everyone who, no matter how you, uh, you know, label yourself, um, we want that to represent all of our faith, all of our community. So that's what we did. Uh, our next book was the Griffin's book. Uh, the Griffin's book is our membership guide. This is a book that we, we didn't publish publicly. We just put it as a membership guide to show people how to join the Norse Society, what we're about, the steps you go through, everything you need to know about what we're doing, our administration, our our circles, our clans, our leagues. It goes into everything that we're, we're that we're doing. So if anybody wants a copy of that, you gotta, you know, you can email me at mark.norna at gmail.com. Um, and you can, uh, you know, send me a message and I'll send you a free PDF of it, or you can, uh, or I'll show you how you can order an actual paper, like, you know, real copy of it. Um, then our next book, which just came out like two days ago, um, it's called the send a book. Now this is a book that, um, that I put out, uh, it's on, you know, our rituals and ceremonies. Um, I, um, I've done a lot of work and a lot of research on rituals and ceremonies and prayers and stuff like that. And, um, I used the Havamal as the foundation, um, the, the, the poem where he, or the part of the poem where he asked, do you know how to, do you know how to offer? Do you know how to pray? Do you know how to send? Do you know how to slaughter or consume? Um, and so in, in that strophe, we actually use that as the, the foundation for, uh, building that bloat system or bloat formula. And so, uh, yeah, so this, this has got, uh, all of the you know seasonal rites, rites of passage, rites of the clans. It's got runic rites. It's got uh, full-on glossary. It's got a record for you to record your own traditions and stuff. Because, like I said, that's that's the cornerstone of it all. It's not me or any of us dictating how people need to perform their bloats. It's us, you know, having allowing people to have that information so that they can create their own traditions and create their own rites and their own bloats. And you know, we eventually want to create a training program to help people do this so that they can make this their tradition. And if people want to use word for word, what we're using in that book, that's fine too. I mean, some people don't have time to sit around writing bloats all day. That's fine. You know, whatever, whatever, however it serves you and, and works for you and yours. We're good with that. So that's, that's the purpose. Um, so, you know, we're trying to lay this, this foundation. We're trying to lay this work out. Now in doing so, we have, we have developed these three branches of the Norna society. The first branch is the circles. Now we've pretty much talked a lot about what we do in the circles. That's all, where our research is. All of our, every one of the fundamentals has a circle to it. So you have a law circle, a lore circle, pantheon circle, and each circle has a project team manager. And that person coordinates what's going on within the circle, um, tries to keep people motivated, keep us writing essays, articles, stuff like that. People write books. Um, they can, you know, um, contribute however they want to academically, uh, you know, and however they feel will help this research go forward now. And that has become, you know, the, the, the cornerstone of everything that we're doing. And it has become what has made us, um, more popular because that's what people know us for is the circles. Now, the lesser known aspects of the Norse society are our clans and our leagues. Now we haven't really gotten any steps forward in our leagues because that's later on. We, we need to build our membership. We need to get pe more people involved, get people involved who want to do this. I mean, because, you know, the, the less people he have, the more time it needs. So uh, I, I can't do everything. We all, the people who are members already can't do everything. So we have to get more people involved. We need to get you involved. If you're out there and you're listening to this, I mean, we need your help. And it, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar. You don't have to be some genius. We're looking for anybody who wants to get involved, who just wants to help. Now, the, uh, the thing is, is that once you have this research, once you start building these traditions and, and, and embracing them and, and, and finding them, you know, there has to be a way to apply them. And that's why we, you know, have the clans. Now, the clans is, is it, it, to me, it's, it's you know, the, the, my favorite aspect of it because it's, it's all of it coming to life. I mean, you sit there and write books and, and, and find information and connect to things. But at the end of the day, um, it's bringing it to life that matters the most. And so we have... Um, of various aspects of the clans that are, are so important things that we feel uh, are necessary for uh, our revival for our, for us to continue moving forward. Um, we have uh, kindreds, 
We've had hearths. We had different groups and stuff like that, which I, you know, I have the utmost respect for all of the organizations out there and all the work that they have done over the years. There's no doubt about that. This has been great work, you know, for the past 30 years or, or 30 plus years. I mean, groups out there like the Odinic Rite, the Austro Folk Assembly and all these different groups. I mean, they're just out there just doing great stuff. But the thing was, is that for me, I felt like we, we needed to take it a step further. We needed to take it a step further so that, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking about seeds that we plant for our kids, things that we, we want to have for future generations. And so when we built the clans, we weren't just going to create fellowships that we call clans. We wanted to have it where it was something that you could take and build something that represents your family for generations to come. It represents your clan and, and all the families that come together are what we call houses. Um, and the houses, you know, that's that's traditional. You have the Hus Freya, the Hus Karls, the Hus Thing, you know, the houses, uh, Hus was house, um, is, is not just a, the place you live in. It was the you know representation of your family. And so your family is your house. And then the houses come together to form a clan. And then the clans can come together to form a tribe, which we, we don't really have that. But, um, you know, then they all are combined and connected to the greater society. Now, when you build a clan, you, um, you're actually going to be given a year um, to build what we call your clan identity. And this is going to be where we're going to help you move forward in building all of your traditions. We're actually going to help you build your own heraldic system, your own heraldry. Well, you'll have your own coat of arms, your own uh, uh, emblems and symbols that represent you and your clan. And, and this is a big deal because this is stuff that once you solidify this and we build a database of it and we have everybody, you know, all linked together with this, then this is this is something that becomes like a genealogy, something that, you know, is, is just lasts for years and years. You think of the, the Scottish clans or the English heraldry or, you know, different things that we still we look at ancient times and we still, you know, pay homage to today and people want to have that. Well, think about you establishing that. Now, we don't just, one thing that people have to understand about heraldry is it's not just finding a pretty picture that you like and making a symbol and saying that's your, your family symbol or your, your coat of arms or whatever. That's not how it works at all. And please, anybody who has any inquiries in this, understand that when you're coming into it, that there's a science to heraldry. There's a science to it that um, represents you in the symbols that you adopt. And these symbols have a method to them. And you have to rep, you have to uh, adopt certain symbols in order to um, in order to be you know so that people can read it. It's like a map, and then you you put the symbols on the map, and then another person can come along who understands the methodology and the science behind it, and can actually read it and know what you're about. And that's the purpose of it. That's what heraldry is. People back in the day, they knew, who understood heraldry knew every aspect. They could look at your your family shield and would know every aspect of your clan just by looking at it. And that's what we're trying to do. So we have a codified system on how we do that. And that'll allow you to build a heraldry for your family for generations to come. And then we have other stuff too, like, you know, how you form your, how you celebrate your rituals, how, how you, which gods you honor, um, you know, naming your filgia, uh, what they call the Aders filgia, the, the clan filgia. I mean, there, there's different, there's so many different aspects of it. But then once you've finished that year of, uh, of establishment, the, the establishment of your clan identity, then, you know, you become registered, you become a part of the clans, and then that becomes something that's codified and, and, you know, locked in stone for years and years and years and years. And then your kids will pass that down and they'll have those symbols on them and they'll honor that. And then they'll say, that's my family. And as you think like a thousand years from now, they're still wearing the, the badge that you made, you know, back in 2017 or whatever. And, uh, so that's, that's a big deal. All right. So um, the, in the last aspect of it is the leagues. Now, this is an aspect we haven't really been able to get into much yet because uh, we're still, um, you know, we're still fledgling. We're still trying to build this up and get it going. Um, we have a lot of members uh, coming in and people ask me for inquiries on membership all the time. And, um, you know, we, we want to get more, more people involved. Um, and once we do that, the leagues are like, like an activist branch. This is the branch that's going to allow people to do work um, that expands us into our communities. Um, every, every league is named after a deity. So you have like Freya's League and you have Tears League. And everyone is focused on the aspects of that deity. So Freya's League would be the League of Women. Tears League would be the League of Warriors. And every league has uh, sort of an infrastructure um, 
uh, aspect to it and an outreach aspect to it. So the infrastructure would be like, like for uh, Tears League, it's to teach people within the society about martial arts and combat and protecting their home and all that stuff. And then uh, the outreach aspect would be, you know, donating to veterans causes and visiting VA hospitals and, and helping out our veterans and, and, and soldiers and warriors and stuff. So the, um, this is something that we're going to move on, move forward with as we keep going. And so you know, this is, uh, this is something that's a passion of ours. This is what we, we want to do. We want to show everybody that we are charitable, that we are, you know, trying to reach out and, and, and help our communities and, and better our communities. And that's what we're, we're really, you know, looking at is, uh, is trying to, uh, to help others. I mean, I tell people all the time that if your faith is not benefiting people, then your faith is useless. If you're just celebrating this religion because you like the symbolism or you like the imagery, you like Marvel comics or you like the Vikings TV show or something like that, then you're really you're really missing the point because it has to be beneficial. It has to serve a purpose and help people in one way or another. If it doesn't, then it's a useless belief system. And that's why some people join it and then they turn away from it because, you know, you, you post things about blood eagles and and slaughtering people and stuff like that. And I mean, that that only goes so far with people who connect to ideas like that. I mean, our ancestors were warriors. They were warriors, but they were also farmers. They were also lovers. They were also people who, you know, wanted to live their lives peacefully and, and put food on the table. And and that's what it's about. And that's what it should be about. It shouldn't be about like just focusing on the warrior culture and making it all like we're, you know, uh, just trying to be all as tough as we can be. And we're all going to Valhalla and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's, that's not what this is about. And that's what the Nordic Society is trying to do is trying to branch out and, and, and explore all the different aspects and all the different traditions so that you can experience that yourself for your lives. Um, and finally, uh, what we're going to talk about is our administration. And we have uh, our administration is, uh, you know, I'm the director. Uh, my wife has been co-director for a long time. Um, we have coordinators. We have a coordinators of promotions, of membership, the treasury, heraldry, the events coordinator, structural coordinator. Um, these coordinators are people who help us to make all this stuff happen. Um, we have, uh, you know, a couple of people now who are working th in this within this position. And, you know, we need more. We need to get more coordinators involved. We need to get more people who want to take leadership roles within our community and basically become our board of coordinators and, and help us to uh, to expand this stuff so that we can learn uh, and understand more ways to get the word out and get people involved and get, you know, get people helping their community and, and spreading the message of what we're trying to do. And and that's important. And, and, and outreach to other organizations that are also true or, or Odinist or whatever, um, you know, because we want to show everybody out there that's involved in this, that we're, we're here for you. I mean, we're here, we're here to serve our community and our community. We're not trying to become like an isolated bubble where, you know, we are the Norna society and our work is for the Norna society. Our work is for every focused member of our community, every person out there who is out there trying to spread, spread our message, trying to spread the idea that, you know, connecting to your ancestry is better than anything that we've ever seen, that this is the most profound spirituality because it is the spirituality that runs through your blood, runs through your veins, runs through your family line. And that's what's important to us. That's the most important thing. So that's pretty much the Norna Society in a nutshell. Uh, like I said, we have our website, www.norna.org. We have a Facebook page. We have uh, our, our email is society at gmail.com. Um, and this is, uh, you know, what we're what we're all about and if you like what you're hearing if you like what we're talking about please you know send me an email uh you know ask ask for a copy of the griffin's book and 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 learn about us and you know see how you fit in um because i promise you that you fit in within this if you're a folkish heathen or you're a member of our folk or whatever then you will fit in within our program you will fit in with what we're doing um and you know we'll find a place for everyone we need people who are motivated. We need people who want to serve our community and help better our community and help grow our community and make us stronger. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people out there who, who want to work hard and see the, the fruits of their labors. I promise you there are fruits. There, there are great rewards in this. And we're going to keep moving forward. We're going to keep uh, mo motivating people and inspiring people for years to come. We're not going anywhere. And uh, I want to thank all the people who are already involved, all the people, you know, Jesse Conley and uh, uh, Carl Parker and 
um, you know, a lot of the people who have, have supported us and been with us, Cameron Modis, um, you know, Steve Kaur, all these different people who have, have helped us and been there with us from the beginning, all the people who are members now, I thank you so much for the work that you've done. I thank you so much for being there with us. Um, you know, I know it's not always easy. There, there are times where it's going to, there's going to be lulls. There are going to be times when we see explosions. I mean, but I, I, I appreciate every one of our members and I appreciate everyone who comes to our society and wants to be a part of it because I know that you're motivated to, to get things done. And that's what we want to see. That's our faith is a faith of action. And we want to get things done and get things moving. So with that, I'm going to sign off on this episode of the Sound of the Yowler Horn. Um, we're going to keep this show going. We're going to do it monthly. Um, we'll, you know, dive back into more uh, spiritual topics in the future. Um, I just wanted to get this introduction so people know what we're about. Um, so with that, I'm going to sign off. This is Mark Career. You guys have a good night. lies captive under the heat. I saw a house on my father's estate Walled with brick and stone Within you